Welcome to Computer Science 320, 2015 Winter 1's Midterm 1 Practice Problems. All right, we are on problem two, part one. And again, just like in the previous problem, we're looking at a piece of pseudocode and we're gonna give and briefly justify good theta bounds on it. And this piece of pseudocode is rather similar to the previous piece of pseudocode, so we're gonna expect something somewhat similar to happen. We've got the same first line that still takes constant time where we set count to zero. Then we've got a loop for i gets one to n if i squared is less than n. So we're actually restricting ourselves now to those cases that we'd kind of talked about last time where i squared is less than n. If i squared is less than n, then for j equals one to i squared, increment count. And then we're going to output we going down. Hope I got that inflection right. And then while count squared is greater than zero, we're going to decrement count. So we've got another loop down here, and let's handle the loops in order this time. We'll handle the first loop before the second, because the second one has maybe gotten slightly more complex with this count squared thing. So for i gets one to n, so we are doing n iterations of this outer loop. But some of the time, an iteration of this outer loop only requires constant time in here. When i is greater than or equal to the square root of n, we just spend constant time discovering that we don't need to do anything inside the loop. It's only when i squared is less than n that we get into that inner loop. So there's gonna be a set of iterations of the outer loop that take constant time and a set of iterations of the outer loop that take maybe something more than constant time. So I'm just gonna analyze them separately. So the first set is the summation i equals one to the square root of n, and I'm not gonna worry about the fact that it should actually go up to just less than the square root of n, and then afterwards it should start at or maybe just more than the square root of n. Those sorts of things, just like floors and ceilings, generally don't matter for our asymptotic analysis. So when i ranges from one up to the square root of n, that conditional inside the loop is going to pass and we're gonna to have to run this inner loop. And in that case, we are summing, I'll go ahead and write it out as a sum, we're summing j equals one to i squared of one. This is still constant time. We still spend constant time on each iteration of the inner loop. And that innermost part, that's pretty easy. That's our same formula as before, i squared minus one plus one, so that's just i squared. And it's the summation i equals one to the square root of n. And as we talked about on the last problem, that is going to be square root of n times square root of n plus 1 times 2 square root of n plus 1 divided by 6. Okay, let's come back to that in a minute. This is kind of the, the first part, if you like, of this loop. What about the second part? And the second part of the same loop is when i is already square root of n, and so we're just going to take constant time in here. So this is going to be the summation i equals square root of n up to n of just constant time, and that's going to be n minus the square root of n plus 1. So asymptotically, this is a theta n term. Asymptotically, what's this? Well, remember, we get to ignore the divide by 6. We get to ignore these plus 1s. They're not going to matter. We get to ignore this multiply by 2, and we get the square root of n cubed. Okay, so you can write this, if you like, as the square root of n cubed, but you're definitely going to want to rewrite it before long because you really want to compare it to this. So how does the square root of n cubed compare to n? Well, remember, the square root of n is just n to the 1 half, so this is n to the 3 halves. And n to the 3 halves dominates n to the 1. So we've got the first part of this loop, the first set of square root of n iterations taking n to the 3 halves time, and the second set of iterations from square root of n up to n taking only linear time. So when we add those together, it's the n to the 3 halves that's going to matter. So overall, this takes theta n to the 3 halves time. Now, we already said that this we line takes constant time. That leaves us with this line. What's count? 
Again, just like in the last problem, count is going up each time through this inner loop. The inner loop's not running every time, but that turned out not to matter, right? Because the times where it doesn't run, that just took linear time. It didn't affect the runtime of the algorithm. So it's still the case, the very convenient case, that count asymptotically is the same as the amount of time we've spent so far in the code. So count is theta n to the 3 halves. Now, we decrement count each time through this loop. How many times do we have to decrement count before count squared gets to zero? Well, it turns out the squared doesn't matter. Count is positive. When is it going to get down to zero? It's going to get down to zero when count is equal to zero. So this is actually the same as, well, count is greater than zero, decrement count. And multiplying count by count, that just takes constant time. So we could actually just change this loop. We could cross out this count times count and just say, well, count is greater than zero. And asymptotically, the behavior would be the same. So what matters is this will run for theta count time, just like we found last time. And because count is n to the 3 halves, this runs for theta n to the 3 halves time. And we add up 1 plus n to the 3 halves plus 1 plus n to the 3 halves. And we end up with an overall answer of theta n to the 3 halves. So this is our solution to the problem. OK, that completes this problem. Next, we will move on to the third part of problem 2.